thank you again for dialing into using technology to enhance learning in the K through second classroom. Um, so we're going to talk about how you can set up a meaningful uh, technology a plan that really enhances the, the learning experience for your students and moves past the novelty of just um, using uh, technology for you know the sake of technology. Um, so uh, for those of you who are familiar with Page and Paxton, apologies for going through this again. Um, but uh, essentially, the whole why, basically why we do what we do actually stems from uh, my childhood. When I was young, my mom actually had she had two daughters. Um, I guess this was in the 1990s, and she wanted to make sure that they were proficient and uh, confident in in science and math. And so they're like most parents do; they try a whole bunch of different things to see what sticks with their kids. And so uh, my mom tried a lot of different uh, methods to get us excited and interested in the subjects. And there were some things that we liked, and there were other things that we didn't like so much. Um, so we, so she decided to take matters into her own hands and develop these really cute puzzle characters uh, that made that made them really fun and easy for us to engage in. Um, so fast forward to about 2011, 2012. Uh, my sister, she was actually studying biology, um, and in Washington D.C. And I was um, before focusing on Paige and Paxton full time. Um, was in financial services. Uh, my last role before this was assistant vice president at J.P. Morgan Chase, and um, you know, but being really interested in um, in STEM fields, uh, both me and my sister are involved in a lot of STEM pipelining programming. Um, and so, uh, one of the big initiatives that I helped lead was the um, New York chapter establishing the New York chapter of Black Girls Code, um, and a whole bunch of different tech pipelining programs and. I was chatting with my sister about how, you know, even those those focus on the middle and high school uh, age level, um, a lot of the disinterest or lack of confidence that those kids had in engaging in STEM um, could actually be alleviated a lot earlier. And so me and my sister started brainstorming, and then we decided to actually tap back into something that worked for both of us in our childhood. Um, and so since then, we've been, um, you know, we we. Uh, Pull the uh, characters out of the the attic and, and revamp them with our, our mom. And since then, we've been trying to figure out, trying to um, uh, deliver a uh, an easy and fun way to introduce them at the very early uh, level of a child's educational experience. Um, and so, we basically uh, focus on the early level again, making it easy uh, to teach, easy to learn. Um, for teachers and for students equally. Um, and we do what we do for a number of reasons. Um, we do it because um, a, you know, not every child has access to um, you know, access and exposure to STEM at home, uh, given that most people who entered a STEM field had at least one parent in the field. So that means that we have a lot of kids um, who are missing out on opportunities that can be life-changing. And so we want to make sure that just because your parents, not a you know an engineer. That if you don't ha if you have the skill set and ability to actually be in that field, that we want to make sure that you you feel confident and that you can be set on that path as well. Um, you know, for teachers, I'm sure many of you guys can relate. You know, there's there's more for you guys to do with, with less time and and less resources. So we want to make sure that um, the the uh, curriculum and materials that we provide. Um, are easy, um, time-saving resources that really help you, uh, you know, get up to speed on any um, area of STEM that you need to, and then be able to deliver that with confidence and in a fun way that can certainly benefit your students. And last but not least, we do it because we we want to we want to compete with the rest of the world. Um, you know that we used to be a country that made everything. Um, now we make nothing <laughs> at all, uh, and that definitely reflects on the um, amount of science and engineers and some and some people that we produce. And, and even if you're not going to be, you know, a biochemical engineer, uh, a lot of entry level jobs require you to be STEM proficient. And so um, we want to make sure that whether you want to, you know, be a, a, a biotechnical engineer or whether you want to be a mechanic, um, that you have the skill sets um, to be able to compete uh, on a global scale.
All right. So we do that through formal and informal environments. So we do we similar to um, the program that you're going through today. We also offer um, easy and affordable STEM classroom materials and. Uh, today and of and uh, webinars like we offer today are giving you that access to those best in class uh, strategies and tips um, and then we also um, we also focus on informal learning environments so we just launched these this year um, we host STEM makeathons across the country so we've hosted them in New York Washington DC um, in Chicago and they're basically an experience where uh, families parents and STEM professionals come together and these little these little learners um, engage in STEM experiences, that, which are led by um, STEM professionals. So if we have a civil engineering module, it's being led by a civil engineer, and so uh, kids can not only have fun and you know test their metal, but they also can connect what are the activities that they're doing to real life careers and start to envision themselves in those careers as well. Um, so those are that's basically a a um, uh, a snapshot of what we do. So we'll go ahead and, and jump right into the content. Um, if you want to ask questions, uh, feel free to ask questions during the webinar in your um, in your in your in your question box. Um, if you and if you are uh, feeling super social, so feel free to also chat with us on Twitter. Um, just uh, mention us and use the hashtag, and we'll ask questions. Um, you can ask questions and talk about what you're learning um, and get people into the conversation, even who aren't uh, joining us directly today. So um, our, uh, our presenter today, um, Jada, she is a math and science teacher at the School District of Philadelphia. Um, Jada has um, a plethora of, ex of experience in um, probably every uh, crucial aspect of, of STEM and um, just education in general. Uh, so um, I'm sure you guys have read her her bio, uh, but she, you know, she's worked in um, in TESOL and ESL. She's worked as a STEM coordinator. Um, she's taught in the classroom, and then she's also, uh, you know, created curriculum and advised on curriculum. Uh, but her particular specialty and passion is really around using technology in the classroom and using it to, um, you know, not just to hinder learning, but actually to solve for a lot of challenges that teachers have in the classroom every day. Um, so we're, we'll just, um, let's go ahead and I will turn this over to uh, Jada, who can... So let me pass this on to Jada. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. All right. Okay. Jada, can you? All right. Yeah. Is everyone able to see? Okay. All right. So I'd like to go over some points that we're going to cover during the webinar. Um, I'm going to cover how to use technology to address the challenges of diverse learning needs at the primary level. And this can be all different types of learning needs. We have, you have your special education students, you have your ESL students, you have students that have specific behaviors um, that you may want to address. So we're going to talk about all of those challenges. We're also going to talk about how to integrate technology with using existing content that you may already use um, to enhance the early learning environments. We're also going to talk about how to develop a solid technology implementation plan and a training plan for your school or classroom. And that's more for your administrators um, or the, your main point people in the building. But for teachers, it's very important to know the different policies that your school has forward. Um, so we're going to cover all those different aspects. It won't let me move forward, can you?
Okay, so how to use um, using technology to address challenges. Okay, so these challenges may include your special education students. You may have students that ha are diagnosed with autism, a specific learning disability. They may have um, a specific impairment in mathematics. They, um, they may have a specific impairment with comprehension. So it's very important to understand um, the learning differences of your students and take that into account when you're implementing anything with technology. The second thing is um, any students that do not know the English language very well, um, the technology may actually help you in communicating with those students. So, so that's something that may be a learning challenge, but the technology can actually be a great asset to you and use it in the classroom. It's always important to remember any socioeconomic factors that your students may encounter. For example, if you have students that have a very difficult home life, they're from a very poor environment, they may not be exposed as to much technology as compared to someone who has a lot of technology in their household. They have phones, cell phones, a lot of televisions, so they may be more prone to knowing how to use it compared to other students that come from more poor environments. And I can tell you, talking from personal experience, that a lot of the parents that I've um, that I've dealt with in the past, um, especially in your more um, difficult social environment factors, that parents don't even know how to use computers and just the simple basic functions. So to expect that of a child who's coming in in kindergarten or even first or second grade, sometimes that can impede your use of technology and make it harder for you to use it in the classroom. So that's all everything that you need to consider. Also the behaviors, learning how to treat any technology with respect, learning that at a young age is very difficult. So knowing how to do that and how to address that. We're going to talk about all those different um, topics today. Okay, so technology that can be used with K2 populations to assist with academic needs. So we're talking desktop computers, but you pretty much know that. Apple products, Android tablets, Chromebooks, smart board or Promethean board, other technologies that are not listed um, can be, they have desks that are made that are desktop tablets, um, that the actual tablet is built into the desk. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can use. Some your school may be able to afford, others your school may not be able to afford. So it's really, like I always like to say, you have to use what you get. Um, currently, in my um, math and science classroom, I have Chromebooks, but although I prefer Apple products, I have to use the Chromebooks. But I make what works for me. Um, even if you have only one computer in your classroom, you can make that really efficient um, if you know what resources um, to use. Okay, so anytime you're dealing with any websites or applications for students, the number one thing, especially at the primary level, is they should be very easy to access. So anytime you're trying to develop a technology program or an idea on how to use it in your classroom, what I would do is store anything that you find in one location. Store um, all those websites that you find that you think are so interesting, your students are going to love it, you get excited about it. You want to store that in a location and you want to make it very accessible to students. So what I like to do is I like to save the web page to maybe my desktop. And I name it letter A, B, C, D, E. I just name it a letter. And my students, when they go to log in the computer, they just have to click on web page A. And you save that to your desktop, and they're able to get in immediately because the internet is already hooked up, all the firewall. It's, everything is already set up for them to just log in on a specific web page. As long as you save it to your desktop and you have a clean desktop, you, they can just look for the letter and they can log right in. 
it's easy access. It's in one location. It makes it very easy for them to get onto the appropriate website without actually having to sit there and type in www.soandso.com. It's very, it makes it easier, especially um, more time efficient. Now, if you're trying to teach those skills, teaching them how to use the web browser, then that's different. But if you want them to just um, go into the specific program or the specific website that you have, it's much easier if you store it in one location. It's also important how to enter and exit properly, making sure that they close out of Windows because it slows down computers. And the number one thing you don't want to have is some students completely slowed down because um, so many windows are, are open. So showing them how to, when you open a window, how to properly close it is also very important. Okay, here's something to always remember when you're looking at applications or websites. It's that technology changes. That one website that you always reference that you get excited about and you want to check up on, it's, the key thing is that there's other websites out there. I've found so many teachers that get stuck on maybe one or two websites, especially for resources. So many resources that you can use. Maybe the resource that you have is great, but it's also important to look and keep looking for other resources that might be of use to you. Keep track of your websites, because I can tell you right now there's websites out there that I loved and I lost them, and I lost the link and I was never able to find it again. It's very difficult sometimes to keep track of websites, especially if we're just browsing. But, it's, but the best thing for you to do is I put mine in a Google document, in a Google Sheet, and I keep the links all in a Google Sheet. And anytime I want to reference it, I look at that. I also have um, a smartphone. What I do is, is if I'm looking it up on my phone, I'm looking at websites maybe while I'm waiting for something at the doctor's or while I'm in the middle of making dinner, I might be looking up websites. And if I know that I'm going to forget the website or what it looks like, I take a screenshot of it. And I, when I go back through my pictures, I'll remember, oh, I need to check out that website. So it's a, really important to make sure that you're always keeping track. And use the website as if you were going to be a student. There's some websites that look good from the teacher perspective, but then when students actually use them, it's much harder. So you always got to approach it from their aspect. Sometimes teachers forget how hard some simple tasks may be, such as pointing and dragging and things of that sort. So it's always good to practice it as a student and know what skills they need to know before you actually assign them to do a specific task. All right, so here's one website that is always always changing. I found it to be a fantastic reference. It has amazing science, amazing math, but not only science and math, it has all the other types of subjects. It is from kindergarten to, I've used it up to fifth grade, um, but it's such a great resource because the resources on there are always changing and the links are never usually outdated. So when you go on there, if you go to the interactive sites weebly.com, You'll find a lot of grade level. Um, you can find it for kindergarten. You can find things for first grade and second grade. And you'll find it to be very interactive. A lot of the games, um, I, I really think a teacher developed this website because a lot of the games are very interactive. A lot of the games are pulled from other websites. So it's pretty much a collection of resources that can be used for pretty much any grade level from kindergarten to almost fifth grade. Um, there's so many things that I can say about this website, but the one thing I need to emphasize is that I would take the time to go in and out of every resource that you are interested in using and make sure that the link still works. Sometimes um, when I've gone on here, I saw that a link was working and then I'd reference back to it maybe a few weeks later and the link wasn't working anymore. So anytime you want to make sure, do it the day before or the day of, and just make sure that the links on the website are, are working. But it's a great reference, especially for your like first and second graders who are right at that time where they're pretty much reading. 
this is a great website. There's also a lot of interactive activities for kindergarten with letters, with shapes, with colors, um, with um, your adult sight words, everything like that. So I would definitely check out this website. This is usually a website favor of many, many students and many teachers. I know a lot of teachers that are familiar with this. Um, but surprisingly, I still come across some people that don't know it. So I always like to reemphasize it's starfall.com. You can also get it as an app on an, an iPhone or an iPad or a tablet. So there's also an application that's now available. Um, and you can do a lot of the same features that you see on Starfall on, actual, on, on an actual tablet. Um, the way that I would utilize this in the classroom, especially at the kindergarten level, is if you have a lot, of, if you have 15, 20, 25 students in a classroom, and you do have the ability to use tablets, this is an excellent application to download onto the tablets and have each student have a headset and they can work through it where you can meet with students one-on-one, -on -one, reinforce skills, while the entire class is actually working on this application. This application has letters, it has beginning reading, um, and it has more fluent reading, it has shapes, it has colors, it has little fun games. So if you have the students work on this, on this concept, it'll reinforce those English, beginning English skills for your ESL students, it will reinforce you know, the, the letter recognition for your special ed students. And you'll be able to work to your top tier and meet with them outside of the tablet and give more challenging work. So if you wanted to create a tiered instruction, downloading this to your iPad, especially at the kindergarten, even first grade level, this is a really good application or website that they can use. And again, like I said, it's online. You can get to it through a website, but now that they have an application that does all of the same features, so I would definitely look into that. So Apple and tablets, ten, Apple, which is the iPad, and tablets, um, which are your Android tablets, are typically very different in nature. I can tell you from research, um, because I have done extensive amounts of research on which is better, that students tend to feel more comfortable on Apple products due to the fact of how easy it is to get into applications. Sometimes, um, and I can give you an example of some Android tablets have a carousel where you have to spin around a carousel in order to find the specific application that the student or you're looking for. Whereas Apple, you can make it really easy where as soon as you open up the screen, they have a screen, you can pick from it. There's some Android tablets that do very similar things, but I'm not advocating for Apple. I'm just saying that there's more applications available that are free on Apple than there are tablets. And I can give you an example. The Endless series, Endless ABC, Endless 123, Endless Wordplay, and Endless Reader are fantastic. Um, they have, it, it may be more for literacy, but there's words that are used on there that are an amazing, amazing, uh, you have to see it. For example, Endless ABC, although you're going through the alphabet, they were going through the alphabet of really challenging words. Words that are really may not, you might not consider to be appropriate for uh, kindergarten first or second grader, but words like rainstorm, and they have to actually take the letters and spell out rainstorm, and then after all the letters have been combined, they'll have a celebration and the word rainstorm will turn into a rain cloud and it'll start raining. So it actually shows you what the word is after you complete the word. Same thing with Endless 123. Endless 123 is fantastic. I, my son loves it. When you, as you get increasing in the numbers, they make you add the numbers to 
get your desired outcome. They make you subtract the numbers, but you're not actually doing it yourself. You're just putting in similar to what a puzzle would be. So if you're trying to get the number two, they would make you put the number two in the puzzle. Then they'll make you put one plus one is equal to two, and then it'll turn to a two. It's, a, it's just a fantastic resource. So I would really look into it. Um, a lot of relate a lot of relation to math and science, especially in, in that series. So you can get that on Apple or iPad. You can get that in a tablet, but it does cost a little bit money if you're using an Android. Um, I believe it's $1.99. I know that you can get an entire classroom for $29.99, but there's ways around that if you say that you're an educator and you're using it for a classroom. So if you're interested in knowing how to work that, you can always email me and how you can get that for your classroom. But there are many other applications that are similar with, that students may be familiar with, like Fruit Ninja. There's another application that's ABC Ninja. There's, um, for science, there's an actual chemical one where you mix different chemicals together and it, it has different reactions. So the kids may not know they're mixing oxygen and hydrogen together, but when they do it in the application, it actually gives them really funny outcomes. And it shows them a little bit, you know, even at the earliest stages of understanding, you know, matter and understanding, you know, your solids, liquids, and gases. So there's a lot of different applications that you can use. You just really have to take the time to go through whatever your app store or your play store and really take the time. There's a lot of free stuff out there that you can find. All right, so we're going to talk about how to integrate technology with your existing content. So a lot of times teachers tell me, oh, well, we're already using this program. I, I need to use this program. How can I do that to enhance what I'm already doing instead of having to reinvent everything? So we're going to talk about how to integrate it into your existing content. So many K-2 classrooms and teachers are using Google Drive. I can tell you from experience, I've used Google Drive for almost five years um, as a teacher, maybe more, maybe eight years as a teacher. But I can tell you that now is really when the push for Google is coming forward. A lot of schools use it. If you don't use it as a school, then that's fine. But I am going to take a moment to talk about it because I've seen it fantastic, fantastic work done with Google Drive at the K-2 level. The students can work in documents, they can create PowerPoints, they can use the drawing board for all academic content. If you are trying to reinforce specific skills, you can actually upload that skill or that worksheet instead of copying it. You can upload it to Google Drive and the students can work out of that worksheet. The one thing that I really like as a teacher with Google Drive is the ability to collaborate if all the students in your classroom are working on it in a computer lab, on the computer, you as a teacher have the ability to go in and out of their documents if they're working in Google. So you can actually be at a distance, be at your desk, or walking around, and you could be walking around with your phone and going in and out of their documents. So the, the fact that it's so accessible is very appealing. Teachers um, can not only upload their content, already they're pre-made, worksheets that were in the workbooks, but they can also create their own. And teachers can prepare lessons and share their lessons with the entire class. Teachers can give online assessments through the use of Google Forms. So if you're interested in any of in knowing how to use that better, you can always contact me. But I can tell you right now that students, you may think that students at the kindergarten level won't be able to understand those concepts. But they do. As long as they're shown, they're able to go into the Google system and figure out where their, the letter K is or the letter A is. Another thing is creating PowerPoints. When I taught kindergarten and first grade, I actually had my kindergarten and first grade special ed students create um, PowerPoints from the letters A to the letter Z 
and they were required to show different animals. So that's definitely, you can definitely make that into a science concept. They were able to show different animals, um, different objects. We, I showed them how to copy and paste. I showed them how to use the letters, and they created it all themselves. It took a long time, but it was authentically theirs, and that's the most important thing. You're not only showing them how to use the computer, you're making them an avid user of it. So it's just, it's it's really nice to see when they're able to take ownership of that technology and be able to use it. And that's the, the key thing that I think Google helps and makes easier is that it keeps it all in one place. The, but there are implications. Students need a school-generated Google email account or a Google email account assigned to the parent. At the K-2-2 level, I had Google email accounts that were, that were created for the students but were assigned to the parents because Google has um, the limitations of who can use the computer at what age. So I have I make sure that parents monitor, uh, if they're under 13, parents have to monitor what's going on in their email because they have to have an email in order to access any of the Google Drive features. So that's a, a big implication. It can work for you, it may not work for you, but it would be something that I would look into if your school definitely uses Google, so. Google Chrome has many free applications. If Again, if you're still using Google, Google Chrome has applications you can attach to your Google Chrome account. Now, if you have a Gmail account, your Google Chrome, you already have a Google Chrome account. You just may not know it, okay? You can actually attach free applications from the Google Chrome store. I can give you one that I definitely use is Reading Write for Google. It helps, this is more for your special education students and your ESL students and the students that may have difficulty with comprehension. It's an excellent resource because I currently use it in my class for my students that have very poor comprehension school skills or like their things read to them. What I do is I upload it to the Google Drive. I upload it as a document. And this application actually reads anything that you put in the document. It reads it out loud. In a really nice tone, it's very, very accurate the way that it pronounces it. It pauses at the right times. So with my challenging science content, with my challenging content, with any challenging content, I usually upload my content to Google and I have um, the Read and Write for Google program, read it out loud to students that are working at a computer while I'll be working with other students. So it, it's a really good resource if it works for you. Again, you need to have Google and Google account in order for this to work for you. But if you're interested in looking into it, I suggest that you make a Gmail account and just see the features first. Um, because I've used the features for my whole class without any of them having a Gmail account. I just use the read and write for Google and it, read it, it reads out loud to the whole class right out of the document. Um, it also highlights certain words um, that may be difficult for students and it categorizes them in another document. So it may be something you might want to look into um, if you're doing maybe challenging content or you're worried about reading comprehension. So this is, this is definitely a resource that I would look into if you're worried about this. Okay, so this is a lot for administrators and teachers alike. Um, you have to have a technology plan and a training plan for your school and for your classroom because in this day and age, I can tell you that technology is growing. The technology that we're using now is not going to be the same technology we're using a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now. We want to make sure that our students are well prepared for whatever work that they're going to do out beyond kindergarten through second grade. We want them to be pre pre prepared for high school. We want them to be prepared for college. So I think it's very important that we make sure that they're getting the early computer literacy skills down now and understanding, you know, how to apply that to other subjects and in, in all their subjects. 
a lot of times what I get is students tell me, oh, I have to do, I'm, their special or their elective might be computers, but they only think about computers as an isolated thing. What they need to learn is that technology is integrated into everything that we do. It's in mathematics, it's in science, it's in literacy, it's in everything. And when they get into the real world, they'll realize that it is integrated for everything. Mathematicians need certain types of calculators, TI-83 when they're in high school. When uh, scientists use microscopes and have to be able to be able to function that um, with a computer. So I think it's important to make sure that understanding what the outcome or the desired outcome, the long-term outcome is going to be. This is why this is important having a plan. So cost is important, but so is durability. This is a definitely for school administration. If you're a school administrator, it's one thing that I need to emphasize that, yes, you want to buy the cheapest possible, but you want them to be durable. When I was a technology coordinator, I always emphasized this. Because when I first started in my role as a technology coordinator, what I found was is the IT department was buying the cheapest computers possible and they were breaking within six months to a year. And we were sending them back to get, because they were still under warranty and the computers were really slow and the students had a really difficult time and they were getting frustrated with our equipment. So when it was my turn to put in the purchase order to buy new computers, I made sure that they were durable. I tested them out as a user. I wanted to see how slow they went. Because if I can't handle how slow a computer goes, a kid is not going to sit there and wait for a computer to load and load and load. So as a school administrator, it's very important to observe classrooms. You need to know what you need out of that classroom. You need to understand the students' needs. You need to make sure that you're buying the right equipment for the students. I can tell you nine times out of ten, most people are like, oh, we're just getting iPads because, you know, they're the best thing possible. But if that's not what your students, if there was something better for your students, I would always like to take that into consideration. And sometimes as school administration, they just sit here, oh, we're going to get computers, and they never actually take the time to really investigate you know, is this a good computer for us? Should we have gotten tablets? Would that be better for us? Should we have gotten the hybrids, the tablets and the computers, the laptops together? So I, I think it's really important to really take a second and really observe your classrooms and develop clear goals and outcomes. Why are we purchasing this technology? What is, what is the reason? Am I going to use it? Is it just going to sit there and collect dust? Am I going to use it once a week? Am I going to use it once a month? Am I going to try to integrate it into my science lessons or into my math lessons or into my literacy lessons? What, am I, what is the reason why I'm using it? A lot of times, and as Kelly said when she first started, a lot of times what happens is we're just using technology to use it, but we're not actually making it, the students make the real world connection to the technology. I can tell you the real world connection to technology is having them create a PowerPoint. Because in the future, they're going to have to create presentations. As an adult, they're going to have to create presentations. So making sure that you know what the goal is, is the most important thing in planning for any technology for your school. Ensure that that plan is solid and you have a backup plan. Because if that, if that technology fails you for any reason, or you need to send it back and get something else, you need to know, OK, you don't have to think about this all over again, you know what your plan B is. You don't have to waste time. And time and not wasting time is being efficient. What will happen if you purchase this technology? You need to know what would happen to the students. Will it help them grow? Will it take away social skills? You need to plan for everything. Which classes will be using the technology? Is it only going to be used in kindergarten? Is it only going to be used in first grade? in second grade or in third grade. You need to really have a great idea on and plan, okay, this teacher is going to use this technology on this day, and then this teacher is going to use this on this day. And then stick with that plan. A lot of times the follow through is the problem. We have the technology, and now the teachers are fighting over the technology card. That if, if the plan is 
if you stick to the outline plan, then you'll really never, you should never have no foreseeable problems. Responsibility. Ensure that multiple individuals in the building are trained on how to use any technology equipment in the building. That includes teachers and staff members, administration, the principal. There should be more than one person in the building that knows how to use the, all of the equipment and use it proficiently. And I say that because for schools that have a high turnover rate, you lose key people. Or if somebody would retire, but that's planned for, of course the retired person will train another person. But if you have a high turnover rate one year for whatever reason, the problem is is that you may lose that one key person that was the only person in the building that knew everything inside and out about that technology. You couldn't have planned for that. But it's very important to plan for it. That this is why I'm telling you it's important to plan and you should have multiple individuals in the building that are able to use that technology and use it well and know how to train other people. It could be a group of five to seven teachers, maybe seasoned teachers, new teachers, um, uh, an administrator definitely. I would take the time and really make sure that that training is held for those teachers or the administrator. And un have a clear understanding of all personal roles, personnel roles with that technology. Yeah, a teacher might be trained on it, but they may not be directly responsible for overseeing it. They would only be responsible for overseeing it in the case that so-and-so was not able to fulfill their duties with overseeing that equipment. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't want that kind of responsibility, but remember, you're always, for one thing is that you're there for your students and you want to give them the best education possible. That's why I always, when it comes to my students, I always make sure, okay, you know, I'll do it. I'll at least know how to be trained on it. So at least when I'm teaching, I'll know what I'm doing. And that's how I always take it. Review the acceptable use policy. Keep it updated. The acceptable use policy is important for all students um, in all classrooms. They need to have that paper signed to allow them to enter the internet with their parents' permission. And keep it updated because a lot of times I just read an acceptable use policy a few weeks ago that said something about MySpace. And MySpace hasn't been relevant for about 10 years. So I suggested that they should, instead of having MySpace, put Facebook and Twitter as a more relevant name of social media on their acceptable use policy. That's the key thing is make sure you're actually reading what it says because a lot of times the students have no idea, okay, I'm just signing this, parents have no idea, okay, I'm just signing this, but they need to understand the different parts and the students need to understand their safety as well and understanding how to be safe. You teach them how to stand physically in line, you teach them how to take turns and go to the bathroom, but there's a thing that you teach that is being safe online is the same thing as physically being anywhere. And safety is so important, and making sure that that safety is always met is should be one of your concerns. So stay involved. Know what's going on in the classroom. Be familiar with which websites your teachers are using, and this is for school administrators, and ensure that goals and objectives are being met. You want to make sure that everything is being met and that there's good follow-through. All right, so teachers, know what you're doing. Practice everything. I mean everything before you require your students to use the given technology. I can't tell you how many times that even though I practice it, it still went wrong. And it's OK if it goes wrong. But the key thing is trying to not, you don't need to know it inside and out. But you need to know it well enough to troubleshoot it because you need to be able to troubleshoot your own minor problems, especially if you're going to be responsible for computers or tablets or other types of tech. You need to be able to figure it out on your own because IT may not always be available to assist you. Use it as a teachable moment. I can tell you a lot of times when I would hit a wall and not know what to do, I would actually have my students talk me through it. Okay, first. 
Did I turn on my monitor? Does my monitor need to be turned on? Okay, second, did I check, you know, my power? Oh, my power is not on. Let me check that. And then I and then the students may laugh or think you're being silly, but it's using it as a teachable moment. So always try to troubleshoot your own problems. Now, if it's a major problem, your smart board is completely not configured, you can't figure out how the cords are working, obviously you can call IT, but try to shoot your minor problem, troubleshoot your minor problems with your students if your classroom environment and your classroom climate allows for that. Um, stay organized. Keep all applications, website organized in folders. I always like to let parents know what I'm using in the classroom so they can try to reinforce it at home. Especially, I have you know, you get your parents that you know, hand over their phone to their child immediately after they get home, then you can tell them, oh, you know what? So-and-so is having really difficult trouble with math. I really think this is an app you should download on your phone. We use this in class. Maybe you, you know, they can think of it as a game that they can play at home, and it will reinforce early um, math skills. So keep those applications handy. Keep them organized. Give them out to your parents. Share your resources with your um, grade partner. Share your resources with your co-teachers. Make sure that the resources are well used. Okay, most of all, and this is the one thing if I if you didn't, if this didn't apply to you, or if nothing in this webinar has helped you, I need you to understand that you should not ever underestimate your student's tech abilities. A student may have a specific learning disability. A student may be ESL. A student may have trouble grasping comprehension concepts. But their tech abilities tend to come a little bit more natural. After a lot of, you know, it, it seems that after practice, they tend to get it very quickly. Um, many students enjoy being challenged with technology. Um, I can tell you that I know of a seven-year-old that I met maybe two days ago that was explaining to me how to do simple coding because they learned it. And I, it just it shocked me. I, I know how to code, but I just never expected a seven-year-old to tell me that they did. And they were able to tell me how they would write a code for a, a specific thing. And it just, I was shocked. And I was just like, that's very cool. So. Some students like to be challenged, others maybe not so much, but the number one thing is don't say that, oh, they can't do that, they're too young. You don't ever want to get into that mindset that they're too young to try it. Always try it and try it and try it again and then try it the next day. Eventually, I will tell you they will get it. Here's another example. I've had preschool students, and I've said this, create PowerPoint presentations with their own letters, numbers, and pictures. I had it, and I've done it in my kindergarten and first grade class when I taught um, special ed. So I can tell you, don't ever underestimate a student's ability, especially with technology. So I thank you very, very much for listening to me. I'm sorry if I was a little crackly. I have a cold. But um, I am currently a teacher in the school district of Philadelphia. As Kelly said, I've done lots of jobs. Um, I'm taking a little bit easy right now because I'm currently in the um, really, really strong stage of my dissertation. And I just wanted to take it easy as a teacher. No more administrative roles for me as, as of right now. But if you ever want to contact me, use me as a resource. You can always ask me different questions about apps. I have hundreds of maybe even thousands of different apps for different subject areas for different grades. So you're more than welcome to email me. My email is my first and last name at gmail.com. Thanks so much, Jada. So um, we're going to go ahead and open the floor for questions. Um, we had one uh, person who asked about um, about technology centers. Uh, so it says, I generally use my technology and center, uh, but when my diverse learners need support, what time frame do you think is best for them, even if they just sat through a lesson that connects them to the reinforcement? OK, so I have used technology centers in the past. Um, 
diverse learners is always an, an interesting topic because the time frame that you want to give them on a computer varies depending upon how the climate in the classrooms go. I never usually have my technology centers longer than 20 minutes, maybe 25. It depends on really the age level. Sometimes they get bored after about 20 minutes of working. But if you have a, if you're working on a specific website or a specific application, sometimes it keeps them more engaged than other students. What I always recommend um, when I'm doing centers with technology is there is a, a really popular research um, learning model. It's called the layered method, where you give students a choice and what they get to do on the computer. I, I've made it Miss Puglisi's Cyber Cafe, and I usually put pictures on a paper, and they can usually work on a specific website until my timer's up. So I let them pick. I show them the pictures of what the website is. They pick it, and they go on it. I, I might, it might be website A, and they click website A, and then after 10 minutes, I say, okay, pick off the menu again. What would you like to play? to keep them constantly engaged and not focused on one website. Some students want to work on one, one website. Some students get bored of one website after about 10 minutes. So that rotating of different topics, kind of, it, it definitely keeps them engaged. Right. All right, yeah, um, you did have a question about the parent involvement. So do you have any other or any additional suggestions on how you can get parents involved? Um, how can we get them to come in or use outside resources to learn about these apps and websites? So I have done, dealt with parent involvement on many different levels. Um, it really depends on how you want the parents to be involved. There's lots of different websites, which if you email me directly, I can direct you to them. Currently, I use um, Class Dojo for my students' behavior, and I connect my parents. I give the, the, student, the parents the username and password, and they're able to track their students' behavior in my class. As long as they log in, off, they can log in off their phone and look. So I try to make it as accessible as possible. So it depends on how you want the parents to be involved. If you're trying to get information out there, there's other things that you can use. Um, if I go to my apps, um, it's called Remind. There's an app called Remind that you can actually forward it to emails or forward it to, um, forward it to even phone numbers that will remind parents about certain things to try to keep them involved. Um, obviously, Parent involvement is always very difficult, but I, what I've done in the past is I've had, um, I've actually had workshops for parents because a lot of times what I'd find is, especially working um, in a really poor, poor neighborhood, a lot of parents don't know how to use technology. And I actually held workshops for the parents to show them how to get onto the computer. Show them how to use their smartphone right and correctly. A lot of times they just have it and use it as a phone. They don't really know the resource it is. So showing them the app to download, actually showing them. And if that has to fall on the teacher, then if you want to have that communication bad enough, then that's what's going to happen. But when, once I showed them actually how to get on the computers, my, our parent involvement definitely improved because now they they have computers at home. They just don't know how to use them or get on anything. So that that's also something to keep in mind that even though they may have the technology, they may not know how to use it. So. That's great. Um, well, thank you, Jada. I think those are all the questions we had for now. I know we had a couple that you answered during the uh, presentation as well. Everybody was very engaged and, and involved in the in the subject. So thank you I'm again glad, for sharing I'm your glad. expertise. <laughs> I appreciate your time, everyone, and the, everyone I do appreciate your time and taking the time to listen. Um, again, if you need me as a resource or you want to know um, ways to help the technology in your classroom, please feel free to reach out to me. So. Mm -hmm.
Well, thank you. I'm, I'm sure you, you. that you'll go and get some email. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you again, and everybody have a good, um, enjoy the rest of your um, week. Bye, everyone. Right, thank you. Bye.